Hello, and welcome to the lecture on simple harmonic motion, specifically the simple harmonic motion of springs. This is the first lecture and first set of sections in chapter 13, and this is a chapter that introduces the idea of oscillations. Oscillations are, are a type of movement, a type of behavior that repeats itself over and over again. We've seen repeating behavior movement before because we've seen uniform circular motion. We've seen circular motion in general, things spinning in circles. But uniform circular motion was nice because it didn't change. Things weren't slowing down or speeding up in the spinning process. It was just steady spinning. And in fact, what we're talking about now, called a, a simple harmonic motion, is really the same as uniform circular motion, just viewed from a different perspective. But what is new, what is fundamentally new that we're doing in this section and in this chapter is we're going to be talking about this type of motion, this motion of repeating, repeating processes in terms of its time-dependent behavior. Because we could never talk about uniform circular motion in, with regards to time. We never knew how long it took other than the period. But we couldn't say where things were exactly because we didn't know the time-dependent behavior. We didn't have the math to find the time-dependent behavior. Just like we didn't have the time-dependent behavior of a pendulum. And in fact, the very next lecture from this chapter is going to be about the simple harmonic motion of pendulums. So this is new. This is, this is like when we first introduced the kinematic equations of constant acceleration. Those were equations that allowed us to relate time, distance, velocity, and acceleration. And that's what we're doing here. We have a direct relationship between time, displacement, velocity, and acceleration, but for a whole different type of motion, for a non-constant form of acceleration, but a very specific form of acceleration. And it turns out it's all about sine and cosine functions. It's all about trigonometry, okay? And here, I think this picture is a great introduction to what's going on, okay? I think this picture really summarizes it very well, obviously, and there'll be a lot more to say, but the idea is that it's a spring, right? Because we are talking about springs in this lecture, and we can imagine this spring bouncing up and down, maybe because someone pulled on it and then released it, and then attached to this spring is a pin or a marker of some sort, and underneath is a steady conveyor belt of paper, and as that spring bounces up and down, it's going to draw a path on the paper as the paper steadily moves to the, to the right, right? As it steadily moves in that direction. And what path will it draw? What, what path will you see as the pin draws along the paper? You'll see a sine curve, okay? That's what the motion looks like. It is absolutely sinusoidal. And we'll show that we can describe the position, the actual Y position of our bouncing spring in terms of A sine omega T, and we'll also we'll primarily use cosine, but obviously there's a close relationship between sine and cosine. And we'll find out what omega is. It's the angular frequency. We'll see how it's dependent on the spring constant and the mass. We'll see about the period of the repeating motion. We'll see about the frequency of the repeating motion and the amplitude, the maximum distance from the equilibrium where the spring would have been if it just stayed at rest. And that's, that's all the kind of the pieces of the puzzle that are allow us to relate time, displacement, velocity, and acceleration of bouncing springs, okay? All right, well, let's give a formal definition of simple harmonic motion, because it's kind of a mouthful, right? What do, we, what do we mean by simple harmonic motion, okay? Well, it is oscillating or vibrational motion, right? So a spring bouncing up and down or shaking side to side, where the force that drives the motion is directly proportional, it's important, that means linear, right? directly proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. Okay, so that's, that's what we need mathematically for this to work. Now, I'm actually, we're, we can't show you the derivation, so I'm not gonna show you how we go from the direct proportionality to actually getting sine, other than to say, hey, it works and it sounds plausible. It turns out it's a solution to a differential equation beyond the scope of the class mathematically, but still, conceptually, it makes sense. Now, I do wanna really be very clear that the spring is, the, really the only true case of the simple harmonic oscillator. Well, we do an approximation for pendulums, and we'll, we'll get to that. But for now, and not in this lecture, but we will get to pendulums. But for now, it's about the spring really being a perfect case because it really is perfectly directly proportional, right? And the idea is, think the reason we know that is think about Hooke's Law. For an ideal spring, we've got a force, okay? That's the, the driving force because, of course, the force creates acceleration, right? And then... As you accelerate from zero, you get velocities, right? That's the idea, right? The force moves things, okay? 
Specifically, it creates acceleration. So there's only one force, just the spring force. And look what it's equal to. It's equal to kx. K is essentially, you know, it's just a constant. It's the spring constant. It's a proportionality constant. And then x is displacement. That's our direct proportionality. That's the, that's the key building block that allows us to describe this type of motion. Okay? And it leads to simple harmonic motion. It's simple because it's the direct, most idealized, idealized case of repeating motion you can come up with which is great, it's a wonderful starting point and there's a lot we can do with it. I don't mean to say it's, it's simple in the sense that, you know, this, oh, you know, there's no problem, you're gonna get this. It's just, the, it's just the simplest case, but it still is a very fascinating problem, okay? All right, so we have another term that I wanted to find, something we haven't seen before, and that's angular frequency. We've seen frequency, right? Frequency is just the reciprocal of period, right? So you have, if, you have, if you have some process, like a, like a revolution of a spinning object that takes two seconds, then the frequency would be one over two. All right, so that, that you have a frequency of 0.5 hertz. On the other hand, if you had you know, a period that only took a fifth of a second, then your frequency would be five, right? Because then you would have you know, the five times per second is how many times it would, it would complete its, its revolution or complete its process. Okay, so, so that, that's frequency, okay? But now what's angular frequency? Well, angular frequency is, I think a good description for it, is a mathematically convenient way to calculate frequency for an oscillation. And the reason is because the way we're gonna use all of our, our functions here, our whole, our whole, all, our, all our position functions and velocity functions, they're all gonna have trig in them. They're all gonna be sine and cosine and, and so on, but they only work based on radians. Now, we could, you could redrive them all to be based in degrees, but it'd be really clunky, because you know, that's the thing about, you know, the, the radians allow for, for simple expressions, and it's worth it. That simplicity is worth, is worth you know, considering radians, right? even though they may be less intuitive than degrees. And likewise, the angular frequency is the way to work, it's the convenient way, to work with a system that's built on radians. So I'll say it now, make sure your calculator is in radian mode when you're doing these problems. Okay? So angular frequency is measured in radians per second, just like angular velocity, and is constant for simple harmonic motion. Notice the, the, the acronym here, SHM, simple harmonic motion. Like angular velocity is constant for uniform circular motion. Okay, so that's the idea. It's a, it's a, constant, it's a constant unchanging value that describes the particular conditions of that simple harmonic motion. Okay, all right. Let's get to our key formulas. Here they are, here they all are. What, what are we dealing with here? Okay, so the first one is, is the big one, okay? It is the actual position function, okay? And so it's a posi position function, I'm gonna zoom in a bit on this, for a simple harmonic oscillator as a function of time, okay? And when, again, we've never done that. We've never been able to describe even uniform circular motion as a function of time, okay? And specifically, it says that when x equals a, that's the amplitude, so that's the maximum distance of, from, of the spring from equilibrium, from where it would be if it was just at rest, <clears throat> at t equals zero, okay? So that's why it's cosine. And compare that to the, to the opening figure above, right? Here, you know, it, we had it starting at zero at t zero, right? So the, the origin, it started here. That's why it was a sine function. That's how sine functions start, right? They start at the origin. Cosine functions, on the other hand, they, they look like that, right? They start at maximum amplitude. And it's actually more intuitive to start at maximum amplitude because most of the time, if you think of a, of a typical spring system, you pull the spring and you release it. So that means at time equals zero, at the moment of release, that spring is located some distance away from, from its, its rest lake, from its, from its rest location, its equilibrium location. So that's, that's cosine. That, that's, the, that's a system described by cosine. And that's, what, that's, that, that's gonna be all of our systems. Every one of our systems is gonna start at maximum displacement, every one of them. We're never gonna have what's called an initial phase angle. It's just, we're just not gonna cover it at all in this class, which is fine, because we're covering plenty of other things. So what we're gonna use as our, as our standard for the position function of oscillators, x as a function of t, this is function notation, notice that, right? This is an x multiplied by t, this is x as a function of t, is a times cosine of omega t, okay? a is the amplitude, maximum distance from equilibrium measured in meters. Omega is the angular frequency measured in radians per second, okay? And t is of course time measured in seconds, okay? Now that angular frequency, omega, it's determined entirely by the physical parameters of the spring, okay? Now there has to be a mass attached to the spring. The spring won't, won't oscillate if it doesn't have inertia because we assume the spring itself is massless or negligible mass compared to the mass that's attached to the end of it. And so there's gotta be a mass. So there's always gonna be some mass attached to the spring every time. And so that's our M, okay? That's the mass of the system attached to the spring, okay? Again, the spring itself is assumed to be massless, units, kilograms, okay? K, well that's the spring constant, okay? T is the period. Okay, and then 
F is the translational frequency. Okay, so look at the relationship between omega and plain old typical frequency. You know, because this 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 translational frequency is just you know repetitions per second, right? And so it's just two pi F, which is the angular frequency is always larger than frequency, because in a full revolution you cover two pi radians, right? Likewise, if we're conceptualizing back and forth motion in terms of radians, going all the way to one point, turning around and coming back, that's two pi worth of radians of displacement. Not actual distance, right? The distance, the actual distance might be 45 centimeters or something, right? But it's always two pi radians of angular displacement, okay? And that's why we have angular frequency. That's how many radians you're covering, okay? Per second. But again, notice that it's equal to the square root of k over m. So you can always determine the angular frequency of a spring oscillator by just knowing the spring constant of the spring and how much mass is attached to it. You don't know anything about it. It's completely independent of the amplitude, right? Okay. Next we have, since we have the position function, we've got the velocity and the acceleration. Again, compare this to the kinematic equations when we introduced them, right? We had, we had ways to relate, you know, position and time and velocity and time and acceleration and time. Same idea here. Okay, so here is the velocity as a function of time, function notation. It's equal to negative omega a sine of omega t, okay? Then we have the acceleration as a function of time is equal to negative omega squared a cosine of omega t. So they're all very similar, right? The only thing that's changing is the value in front and the type of function, okay? And they're changing because they're out of phase with each other. And in fact, it makes perfect sense the phases that they are. And I'll, and we'll, I think we'll, I'll make this clear by the, by the time this lecture is over, okay? Let's label some things here. Okay, so this first, this is just labeling the whole equation. This is velocity as a function of time. Okay, this, that's, that's the whole equation. Next up is the actual velocity amplitude. Because if you think about it, the number in front has to be the amplitude. Because think what, think what trig functions do. They vary between negative one and one, right? So that means the amplitude or the position is going to vary between negative a and a. That's as far as it's going to go from equilibrium. Likewise, the velocity is going to vary, thanks to sine, between negative omega a and omega a, right? That's, that's as big as, big as the velocity is going to get and as small as the velocity is going to get, right? In terms of the negative number being, being small, right? In terms of the magnitude, it's going to max out at both ends, okay? So that's the, the velocity magnitude, okay? Or the velocity amplitude. So that's v max. That's as fast as it's ever going to go. Now, it's going to be zero too, right? You're always going to have a point in any oscillator. Think about a spring bouncing back, back, bouncing back and forth. There's a moment when it's at maximum extension or maximum compression where it's momentarily not moving, right? We know that. We've seen that with conservation of energy. We've, and we're, and we're, going to, we're going to be reminded of how we can deal with springs using conservation of elastic potential energy and kinetic energy. It's very much still here. But what, what energy couldn't do for us, it couldn't tell us the time. It was wonderful for relating velocity to position, but it couldn't, give, it couldn't give us time. Now, if we had a position, we could find an acceleration using, using Hooke's law and you know, Newton's second law. So we could, you know, we could actually set up the force diagram and find, find an acceleration at a particular position. Likewise, we could find an acceleration at a particular velocity because we could relate the velocity to position using energy. You get the idea, right? But we couldn't do anything with time. All right. well, I'll, you know, maybe we'll stop advertising that, but that's, that's the key difference here. Is now we can finally answer questions about oscillating systems with time. Okay, and here's the acceleration as a function of time, and you, you probably don't guess next up is this right here, omega squared times a, because that's the maximum acceleration, okay? And these are all translational terms because it's a spring, right? Springs translate back and forth, okay? Yes, you know, the, the, the function is an angular, you know, an angular function, but it's still describing translational motion, back and forth motion, okay? Now check out, check out this picture over here. Now we're gonna do this in one of the a concept question coming up, we're gonna, you know, I'll, I'll, work, I'll walk you through it, but I wanted to include it here on the front page as well of, of the lecture notes. This is showing the position function here, okay? Using the cosine, the cosine standard, right? The idea that we start at amplitude, we release the spring, and then it's gonna move, it's gonna move through equilibrium, right? At that point, of course, it will have exchanged all of its elastic potential energy for kinetic energy. Then it's gonna compress, it's going to compress to a point where it reaches negative amplitude because it will compress as much as it was stretched. It's the perfect spring after all. And then it's just going to repeat, okay? So that should make sense. Notice that the, this axis here is time, but we can think of a full period as taking two pi radians. Like it's a repeating process. We can divide that process into radians. And that's, that's an abstract idea that I think, you know, is, can be tricky at first if you're not used to it. Saying, okay, well, the axis definitely here is time. It's measured in seconds, right? But 
At the same time, although the, you, know, you have the period, you can almost think about an angular period. You can think about the whole process taking two pi radians to repeat. So that means the phase to go, that's the term, right, for, for moving you know, in an angular displacement, the phase to go from maximum amplitude to zero, that's one quarter of a full, a full oscillation, so it's pi over two, because a full oscillation is two pi, right? So a quarter of that is pi over two, okay? And I've drawn all these vertical dashed lines to compare to the other equations, the equations of velocity and acceleration, velocity in meters per second and acceleration in meters per second squared. So notice, right, when you, when, when you release the spring, the velocity is zero because you're releasing it from rest. When, when the spring reaches its equilibrium, it's sped up as much as possible because, as I said, it's exchange energy types, the potential to kinetic, and so now it has a maximum velocity. But notice it's negative. That's because if you define the stretch as positive, and it's often, you know, our system starts stretching a spring, but it could just as well be compression. Well, you define that initial displacement as the positive direction. So if you're displacing in the positive direction, as soon as you release it, which way is it going to go? It's going to go the opposite way that it was, it was either stretched or compressed. So it always starts off with a negative velocity. That's why the velocity is negative sign, because it always will start moving in the opposite direction, right? It has to, because it's trying to return to where it was. That's the whole idea. And we call the spring force the restoring force of the spring. Right? And so, yeah, it always starts off negative, and then, in fact, the velocity won't become positive until it's gone through half of its first oscillation after pi radians. Okay? And that, that comes up a lot. And then we've got, <clears throat> finally, the acceleration. And the acceleration, likewise, is, is initially negative, because when you release it, the acceleration is initially causing the, the spring to speed up. So the initial acceleration is negative, but the acceleration becomes positive sooner than the velocity. Because you think about it, when you release the spring, it's speeding up, it's moving towards maximum velocity, and then it, then it hits where the, it's rest length, the equilibrium point of the spring. At that point, though, now the spring is compressing if it was initially stretched. And if it's compressing, what is it doing? Well, the spring is slowing down. Well, since the spring is slowing down, that means the only way you can slow something down is with opposing sign acceleration. And that's indeed what we see. We see the acceleration has become positive at this point when the velocity is slowing down. And that, that exactly explain, explains the different functions of cosine for position, negative sine for velocity, and negative cosine for acceleration. So we can see there is a pi over 2 phase shift to go from position to velocity, then another pi over 2 phase shift to go from velocity to acceleration. That means if you want to consider going all the way from acceleration to excuse me, from position to acceleration, it would be a pi phase shift. So they're a full half wave out of phase, right? A full oscillation, out, full half oscillation out of phase, which means they'll always be maximum at the same time. And indeed we can see, right? The, amp, the, the values, the absolute values will always max out and zero out at the same time. See how they, right? We have zeroing out coinciding, okay? We have maxing out coinciding. So maximum position corresponds to maximum acceleration but the signs are always opposite. So if it's max of po maximum positive displacement, then it's maximum negative acceleration, okay? All right, so that, that's, that's the, the, it's so important to see the picture, I think, to see that this is very much a repeating process and it just continues on and they're always gonna have the same relative phase shifts, okay? So now energy. I, you know, I've, I've mentioned before that you know, we could have done the, a lot of this with energy and now, now though we have another thing we can do with energy is we actually think about time-dependent energy. So we can say, okay, well, we can have, just like we can have time-dependent position, velocity, and acceleration, we, have, we can have time-dependent potential energy, that would be elastic potential energy, and we can have time-dependent kinetic energy. Because the forms of potential energy and, and kinetic energy, one-half kx squared and one-half mv squared, they can be rewritten in terms of one-half k squared cosine squared omega t and one-half k squared sine squared omega t. Now you might wonder, you might wonder where the m went. Well, the m went by just applying the definitions between omega and k, that's all. All right, we just, it's just a simple substitution, okay? But it allows us to cancel out A. And the beauty of that is then we can use the well-known trigonometric identity, cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, actually factor out the like, the like term of one half Ka squared and show that the total energy, the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy is just one half Ka squared. But that makes sense because the total energy at some point is gonna have to be entirely elastic potential. And when is, when is the, the energy of this oscillating system entirely elastic potential? When it's at maximum amplitude, when x equals a. So that would be e total. Likewise, we could say that e total equals one half m v max squared. See it? Because at that point, that's when it's ever in, in, at passing through equilibrium. At that point, the energy of the system is entirely kinetic. Okay? 
but we can find it at particular times as well, right? We could say, you know, how much of the energy is this proportion you know, of kinetic or, or elastic potential at five seconds once it's released and so on, right? And we'd obviously just need to know the, the period or the, um, the angular frequency of the system, which means all we need to know is K and M. So it's, you know, they, they, it's, it's amazing really how much information we can gather by just knowing a couple things about the spring. How much was it stretched versus its amplitude? How springy is the spring? And how much mass is attached? Okay? And coming directly out of, out of these, these energy expressions is a way to express maximum velocity in terms of the amplitude. Okay, so this is a nice kind of convenient expression. It's again, nothing new, but I just, I just include it here because it, it can come up a lot. And then finally, a nice expression here that relates velocity to position. So this is velocity independent of time. Now, again, this is kind of funny because it, really the new utility of this material is to do it with time, right? Because we could have derived this way back in our chapter when we you know, introduced conservation of energy, all right? So really, this isn't anything new, but sometimes it's good to have something old because we've got to have multiple techniques to solve our problems, right? And just to show how everything's interconnected. Okay, so let's make sure I add all add the labels here. All right, so this is the maximum velocity of the oscillator. That's V max, okay? And then we've got velocity as a function of position for the oscillator. Okay, so enough on our key formulas. I think we should finally get to some practice, huh? Okay, so we have three types of problems. Zoom in on a bit here. Um, four types, excuse me. So we have type one, problems that involve finding position, velocity, and acceleration of a spring oscillator for specific times, for specified times. Okay, so that we're just gonna use the functions. Basically, we just, you know, maybe find some unknowns like the angular frequency and just use the functions. So it should, should be straightforward, all right? Type two, problems involve using conservation of energy to relate position and velocity for a spring oscillator, okay? Type three, problems involve finding energy values of a spring oscillator for specified times, okay? So actually energy, but at a time. And then finally, type four, fairly complex problems that involve finding the position, velocity, and acceleration functions of a spring oscillator followed, um, followed an applied, or following an applied force or change in momentum, okay? So basically kind of an extra step, right? We're tying it in with some other idea. Maybe a collision, and I have an example of that. Where there's a collision and then it leads to oscillation. So you have to kind of set up the oscillation by following the initial steps of the collision. And just because they have that extra step, they're a little bit more complex, okay? So let's get to the first one, example one. Okay, so very, very classic idea here. We got a, a mass attached to a spring. We know the mass, we know the spring constant. Let's just think about this most basic of a spring oscillator system. Okay, so a known mass. All right, um, basically uh, 1,360 kilograms is attached to a large horizontal spring with spring constant 222,000 newtons per meter, meter. The mass is compressed into the spring a distance of x equals 2.05. So that means this is basically, this is the positive x direction, so we're calling compression positive. Okay, and that's from equilibrium, that's where the spring just would have been resting, and then released from rest. Okay, so that means we're definitely going to have a cosine for a position function, all right, which we always will. What is the position, velocity, and acceleration of the mass at t equals two seconds after it is released? Okay, so we need to find, so you say here, we need to find the position function for the spring mass oscillator. That's, that's how we should think about starting this problem, okay? And which means that we need to find omega, okay? Because you can't, can't do any of this without finding the angular frequency, okay? Because notice the angular frequency showed up in all the equations, okay? Well, we know k and m, so it should be easy to, easy to find, so we just plug in plug in our known values, and we find that the angular frequency is 12.8 radians per second, okay? And that, that means we can also find the period, and I think sometimes, although period isn't asked for, when you're solving problems of time, it's so much easier, so much more kind of, there's so, more, so much more confidence you can have in your answer if you calculate the period, and then you think, does this make sense? Does my, does my answer make sense? And if I'm getting a value that is about a quarter of a period and I'm getting a number that corresponds to equilibrium, well, that should make sense because it takes a quarter of a period to reach equilibrium the first time. That's the first time you're gonna pass through equilibrium, okay? So it takes a quarter of a period from release to pass through equilibrium the first time. It takes a half period to get to the other far side. You know, if you, you start a compression to get the maximum extension. And then it takes three quarters of a period to pass through equilibrium the second time. And then it takes a full period to get back to where you started. And so, so many times it, you can make sense of your answers if you're solving for time by knowing the period. So in this case, if I wanted to find the period, I would take two pi and divide by my angular velocity. So I'd, in this case, I divide by 12.8, okay? So I find that the period is about, so t, right? And the t is always t, t equals two pi divided by omega is about half a second, so about four nine second, 0.49 seconds. And if you wonder where I got that formula from, where, how I know that um, the period is two pi divided by omega, it's simply from rearranging 
the expressions over here under the key formulas and just solving for t, right? So I just basically just using this, these two and solving for t, okay? Okay, so we know it's about, about half a second is the time to make a full oscillation for this particular system. Keep that in mind, okay? All right, and then we know that we know the amplitude. It's the initial position. It's 2.05 meters. Wonderful. Okay, so then we can go go ahead and gather that information and kind of plug it into the function. That's really the way you should think about this. You you're solving for the missing pieces of the function, and then you're plugging it in to make the function usable. Okay, so here here is the function. X is a function of time. I plugged in the uh, the known amplitude and the known angular frequency. Okay, and then at the particular time that I was asked for, at two seconds, that means all I just have to plug in t equals two seconds plug it into my calculator and make sure my calculator is in radian mode. I will stop reminding you about that, okay? And then so I get 1.87 meters. Okay, so that's, that's interesting, okay? Does that answer make sense? Well, after two seconds, how, how much of a period is that? Well, I told you the period is about half a second. So two seconds is pretty darn close to four complete periods. So that means we're almost back to where we started. Oh, well, 1.87 meters is pretty close to positive 2.05 meters. That answer makes sense, okay? All right, okay, and then I'm gonna do the same thing for velocity, okay, but of course I use the velocity function, all right, and then I'll plug in two seconds, and I get negative 10.7 meters per second, okay? Now, this might sound, sound like a large velocity, considering that we're almost back to where we started, and we started from rest, but the thing is that the velocity kind of decelerates quickly at the end. That's the nature of sine functions. They don't have you know, constant like, slope to them, obviously, right? They're, they're completely flat at one point and they have a, steep, a steepest point you know, halfway between the two flat points. And so that, it can be a little deceptive. One thing you could do is you could find out, well, what's, what is the maximum velocity? And we can see that the maximum velocity is about 12.8 times two, so about 24. So this is, this is well less than half the maximum velocity. So that, that makes sense, you know, that it's, it's nowhere near equilibrium. It's definitely well on its way to slowing down. And in the next, you know, the next 20 centimeters, it's gonna slow all the way down to zero meters per second. Okay, when it, when it comes and when it finally completes, it's, it's fourth, uh, you know, it's fourth um, oscillation. Or actually, I guess it's, it's, it's a little bit past, but you know, it's a little, uh, slightly before, okay? And then finally, the acceleration, okay? And same idea, plug in the test. This is just, again, just copying down the equation and then plugging in the time. Okay, and again, this is literally this equation from the key equations. And I just plugged in omega, made sure to square it, all right? And I get negative 306. It's a big value, right? Because this is actually pretty close to the maximum acceleration because it's pretty close to, um, to returning to maximum extension, well, maximum compression, excuse me. Okay, all right, so that's the idea. Just plug in the values, okay? Now let's look at part B. How much time will pass after t equals two seconds until the next time the mass experiences maximum acceleration? Okay, so let's think about that, right? So how long? So maximum acceleration is gonna occur at, you know, at points of either maximum extension or maximum compression. So how, how, far do, how much time do we have until our next maximum extension or maximum compression? Let's see, okay? So here we'll actually find the period. So you see, two pi over omega, that's the way you always find it. And it is indeed 0.492 seconds. So we see that two seconds is shortly after the fourth oscillation. All right, so we've, we've already kind of passed, we've overshot the fourth oscillation, which means we're on our way back to equilibrium. So that means we actually have a little while to wait. We have to get all the way to maximum extension. We have to pass through equilibrium and get, ma and get back there. So that means the next time that the acceleration is going to be maximum is going to be four periods plus a one-half period, okay? Because again, we already overshot the four periods, which exactly four periods would have been a maximum acceleration. But we need another half period to get, to get the next time because there's two maximum accelerations per period, just like there's two maximum velocities per period and there's two maximum positions per period, right? As long as you take the absolute value. Okay, all right, so then it's just a matter of saying, okay, well in that case, we would just take our four plus one half t minus two seconds, or nine halves times the period minus two, and you could do it differently, right? You can kind of find the different, you know, cancel out the things that don't matter. But regardless, this is a totally fine way to calculate it. And there we find that it's about 0.213 seconds, okay? Until we're gonna get maximum acceleration. Because although this is pretty close to it, it's overshot it, so we have to, we have to wait, you know, a fifth of a second to get back there, okay? It's a long wait. Okay, let's move right on. Okay, so a bouncing spring has an attached mass of 2.3 kilograms and a measured period of oscillation of 200 milliseconds. Okay, so a very fast one. What is the spring constant of the spring? Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So in this case, we'll use omega, but instead we're going to then solve for k. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace omega of two pi over t, okay? Then I'm gonna cross multiply and square both sides to solve for k, and then plug in my known values, because I have the mass and I have the period, 
okay? And I find that my spring constant is 723 newtons per meter, okay? So all I did there was just use, just use this relationship and isolate K, okay? Hopefully that seems straightforward. Um, next, part B, if the amplitude of the bounce is 6.12 centimeters, where will the mass be located relative to equilibrium after 340 milliseconds? Okay, so I'm going to just acknowledge what the amplitude is, excuse me. I'm then going to um, actually calculate the angular frequency this time because I haven't yet, haven't needed it, and I get 31.4 radians per second. Then I'm going to take that information and plug it into the position function, okay? And then here we're saying, what, where will the mass be located at a particular time, okay? Well, that means all I have to do is just plug in that particular time and get an answer, and we get a negative position, okay? Why negative position? Because we're on the other side, right? Whatever, if the, you know, let's see, let's see was um, a bouncing spring, right? It definitely starts at t equals zero. So if we called, if we called extension positive, it wasn't specified here, but if we saw it called extension positive, this then is on its way into compression. So it's passed through equilibrium, and it's gone from positive to negative. Because that's really important to understand, right? Is that if this is the positive x direction, then the other direction on the other side of equilibrium is always negative x. There always has to be a zero because that is always defined as your x equals zero. It has to be, otherwise the, the choice of trig functions wouldn't make sense. Okay, so that we have a fixed coordinate system here. Okay, all right. So there we have a negative position after that, that length of time. All right, it looks good. And you know, does does that match up, right? Well, I'll, I'll let you think about that, but it definitely does, right? Thinking about and you know that a period is two, 200 milliseconds, and this is over a period, and how much more, right? Basically, it's you know it's it's one and a half periods and a little bit more, right? So it should make sense this value, okay? And then in part C, what will uh, what will the be, what will the velocity be at 610 milliseconds? So simply in plug, matter of plugging it in again, okay? And there we have another value, okay? Negative as well, okay? And in this case, right, it's negative because it's a different time. If I'd, if I'd found the velocity at 340 milliseconds, then it would have been positive because the sign of the velocity and the sign of the position are always, they're always going to be out of phase, right? They're, you're never, you're never going to have the, you know, the, same, the same sign, right? Um, well, I guess that, no, that's not true because you can have it, you can have it moving. Here, let's, let's consult our picture over here, right? So you, you can have a time, right, where you have, let's see, yeah, you can have positive velocity and positive position as long as, long as it's, you know, kind of con its way back in. Okay. Okay. All right. But again, example two, pretty similar to example one, just kind of a variation on, in terms of a different setup, right, that given different upfront information. Okay. Now let's do some concept questions. Make sure we really got a good foundational understanding of this, of these ideas. Okay, I think that's, that's so important, right? To really be comfortable with the, with the trig and the idea of the periods and split in, you know, what's a, quarter, what's a quarter period and so on, okay? All right, so the figure shows the position versus time graph for a particle in simple harmonic motion. That's this one right here, okay? At what times is the particle moving to the right at maximum speed? Movement to the right is defined as positive, okay? So in this particular system, we define the, the right as positive, okay? Okay, all right, so let's see, right? So moving to the right... Well, that's going to be a tangent line that is sloped up, okay? So that has to be all these ones. So that, right, there's a slope up, there's a slope up, and a slope up, okay? So at maximum speed, because, you know, sure, there'd, there'd be a slope up here too, but it's not a steep. So this is the maximum steepness, and, the, and it's all sloped up. So that means it's going to occur at 0 seconds, 4 seconds, and 8 seconds, okay? 0, 4, and 8. Excellent. At what times is the particle moving to the left at maximum speed? Okay, well, I bet you can guess, right? That's going to be the ones where it's all sloped down at the steepest angle. All right, so that's going to be 2, 6, all right? And that's it. That's the only ones that fit. So it's 2 and 6 seconds. At what times is the particle instantaneously at rest? Well, here we're looking for a horizontal tangent line. All right? So that's going to be 1, 3, 5, and 7. There we have it. Okay? Okay. Now, that's, that's the key idea, right? That's reading the position versus time graph, a sinus, sinusoidal position versus time graph, and interpreting the meaning of the tangent line at different points in terms of its, its meaning with regards to velocity, okay? And then let's use this information. So draw the corresponding velocity versus time graph below the position versus time graph, okay? So I'm going to draw vertical lines to match up with these key points. And so basically it's going to allow me to connect the dots. And I know I'm going to connect the dots with another essentially trig function, okay? Just one that's phase shifted, okay? And so then I know by connecting the dots, that I would, I'm going to have right a negative or a zero here because that corresponds to one of the pink horizontal lines. Another zero here, um, another another zero right here, right, and finally another zero. And it tells me where my maxes are going to be in terms of max positives and max negatives. 
right? So there we go. That literally is just connecting the dots. Now, in terms of acceleration, because I say here, draw the corresponding acceleration versus time graph, we'd have to do the same thing. You'd have to think about the tangent lines of the velocity, because here there's a horizontal tangent line, so that's going to correspond to zero velocity. Here there's a steep negative tangent line, so that's going to correspond to the maximum value of negative acceleration. So you didn't do the same sort of thing, right? So you'd start you know, with the idea of zero and then negative, right? And then we have zero again, and then we're going to have uh, positive, right? And look, you just connect the dots. Okay, and here we have it. Here we have our acceleration function. Again, just using tangent lines and connecting the dots. Okay, all right. Question two, consider the function x of t equals a cosine two pi t over the period. That's interesting. This is a different, where's the omega, right? Why well, just replace the omega with two pi over t? Because omega is just equal to two pi over the period, okay? Because big T is the period, that's a, that's a constant, right? That, that's for the system, that doesn't vary. T is the actual variable, of course, right? So distinguish between lowercase t and uppercase t, okay? And this is just a reminder what, what, the, what we did, right? We took the typical form of the position function and just tweaked it a little bit. So then with this, this tweaked form, we should be able to easily answer these conceptual questions. What is the next time at which x has a value at t equals zero, okay? Well, t equals t, right? Because you think about it, if I plug in t equals t, right, if I, if I set my variable time as the period t, and I plug it into my function, then I'd have a t in the numerator and a t in the denominator, they'd cancel out inside the cosine, which is just leaving me of cosine of 2 pi. What's cosine of 2 pi? If you don't remember, plug into a calculator, but you should be able to visualize this and think about what cosine of 2 pi is. Cosine of 2 pi is 1, okay? Not negative 1, not 0, 1. And that means that, the excel that we would return to the original value of position, the, the, the amplitude, we'd return to the amplitude A, and I almost said acceleration because I saw the A, right? But we return to the amplitude and after one full period. But of course that makes sense because you return to where you started after one full period, okay? All right, question B, what is the first time after t equals zero when the position is zero? Okay, well that would be one fourth of t, okay? Why? Well look what happens when I plug in one fourth of t. I plug it in, again, my t's cancel, so now I just have 2 pi over 4, which is then just pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2, that's 0. All right, see, see how this works out? See how you can really kind of read the trig function? Okay, and then finally, at what value of x is time equal to 3 halves of a period? So in other words, where are you located after 3 halves of a period? Well, first of all, see if you can kind of, if you can visualize this. The 3 halves of a period, okay, so you haven't quite got the period where you're located, so after, after, you know, well, you actually, you already passed, right? Because so that, that's one and a half periods, right? So, you know, you got, you got back to where you started and then you've got a half, a half period since, which means you should be on the opposite side of where you started, right? Well, let's see. So then we just plug in three halves T, okay? We'll plug it in and see what we get, negative A. Why negative A? Because cosine of three pi is negative one, okay? Cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi is negative one. Cosine of 2 pi is positive 1. Cosine of 3 pi is negative 1. Cosine of 4 pi is positive 1. 5 pi, negative 1, so on, right? Because, of course, it's just repeating. All right. Okay, a couple more examples. We're either going to get into the energy ones now. Okay, so a 2 kilogram object attached to a spring whose spring constant is 500 newtons per meter executes simple harmonic motion. If its maximum speed is 5 meters per second, okay, the amplitude of its oscillation is what? So here we're going to use that maximum um, velocity equation, okay? So we'll use, first of all, um, we'll consider the angular frequency, plug in the information because we have everything we need to find the angular frequency, and we get 50 radians per second, so really high angular frequency, by the way. And then we'll plug in our, um, basically, our, our um, velocity function. And here, actually, I'm not, I'm not even using the, the other expression because I'm just going to say, well, this is going to be maximum when it equals negative omega a. So V max equals omega a, right, in, in magnitude, e equals, equals omega a, because, you know, the absolute value, the negative doesn't matter. And so then I just set negative, or I set omega a equal to v max, which is then going to be equal to 5 meters per second, and then I just solve for a, see, and I get 10 centimeters, or 0.1 meters. So kind of neat, right? We can actually solve for the amplitude given the maximum speed, the mass, and the spring constant, okay? Now, could we have solved for the amplitude if we had only been given the mass and the spring constant? Certainly not. We needed that extra, that extra bit of information because essentially we're using energy conservation, right? But kind of in, a, in a, a new form. Okay. So example four, a horizontal um, spring with spring constant 
K equals 435 newtons per meter, and attached mass of 2.6 kilograms is given an initial amount of elastic potential energy of 10.5 joules, and an initial amount of kinetic energy of 15.9 joules at T equals zero, okay? Now, by the way, this is a system that is starting with both um, kinetic and potential, so I'd never ask for the position function for this one because it would require a phase angle, but we're not gonna ask for that, all right? And then what is the resulting amplitude of the oscillation, and what is the resulting maximum velocity of the oscillation? So, okay, here's the picture, right? Spring, right? It's got some initial velocity. It's got some initial position. The amplitude would be greater than that, that initial position because it, there's leftover energy, okay? And we're going to find the amplitude of the oscillation just using traditional conservation of energy, right? But, you know, kind of in, in our little kind of, our new, our new way of, our new take on it, right? Just like slightly, slightly kind of reformatting things, focusing on different terms a bit more. So we're saying that the total energy in the oscillating system is one half K A squared. A is the amplitude. Okay, that's a term we wouldn't have seen before, amplitude, right? Okay, it's a specific to oscillation term. And then we're gonna go ahead and say, okay, well, we know that the initial kinetic is 15.9. The initial, um, and that, well, that was, was that kinetic or potential? That was kinetic. The initial potential was 10.5, and that must be equal to the total being one half Ka squared. We know K, so then, hey, let's solve for A. All right, so I just simplify this a bit, and then isolate A, and then we indeed, we get the amplitude 0.348 meters, okay? Great, all right, we found it. And again, we could have done this you know, with just traditional conservation of energy, okay? And then we, um, we're saying that you know, this is then equal to the initial potential energy, all right? And let's go ahead and then find the initial position, okay? So then the initial position is 0.22 meters, less than the amplitude, that makes sense, of course, because there was velocity to start with, so it couldn't have, you know, the initial position couldn't have been the full amplitude, okay? And then finally in, Part B, let's get there, okay, what's going on? There we go, sorry for the delay there. Um, we would use one half MV max squared equals E total. Okay, and that, that's, just, that's just considering that at some point the, the energy in the system is entirely kin, um, kinetic energy. And so then we then can solve for the maximum, the maximum velocity. And indeed, there's our value, 4.51 meters. Okay. Okay, looks good, right? Okay. So that was just very, very much an energy approach, but in the context of oscillators. Okay, so let's look at one here. All right, so we have a 2.5 kilogram block oscillator on the end of a spring with a spring constant of 200 newtons per meter. If the oscillator is started by elongation of the spring uh, by 15 centimeters or 0.15 meters and, and, given, and giving the block an initial speed of three meters per second, then what is the maximum speed of the block and the total energy in the system? So again, right, kind of start, starting off an energy system. So I point out that we could do this problem entirely with conservation of energy, you know, using material from a previous chapter, but let's use our new technique, our derived expressions, all right? So we're just gonna use here that this, this is a way to express the amplitude in terms of the initial position and the initial velocity. And so we can find out the amplitude is 0.18 meters. That's just the maximum displacement from equilibrium. And then we can go ahead and find the angular frequency. Because the neat thing is once you find the angular frequency, it's very easy to find the maximum velocity. It's just omega times A. So it's kind of, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a different, different approach, right? It's kind of a, a nice, fast approach. Being like, okay, well, you know, maximum velocity is omega times A. So I can easily find omega. It's just the square root of K over M. Okay, and then we can go ahead and find that our maximum velocity is 5.2 meters per second. Okay, all right. Okay, so here I want to do a little derivation. Okay, so I want to I want to actually show show how a an idea is 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 connected between uniform circular motion and this motion of a spring, a spring bouncing back and forth. And this is, this is, a, real, this is a real nice derivation because it really, kinda, it really shows us what we're talking about to make sure we're, we're clear on how this is similar to things we've seen before. So we wanna show that simple harmonic motion is the same as uniform, uniform circular motion projected in one dimension. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Okay, so here is our picture. All right, so let's start with uniform circular motion. So in uniform circular motion, we've got a circular path, okay? We've got the velocity, right? We, can, we have the actual velocity vector, and we can see that the velocity vector is composed of x and y components, right? And the x and y is just the axis here in the center. 
just the, the, x, the x and y axis, okay? And so obviously we can split the velocity into the components of, of that coordinate system. Furthermore, we can think about the position of our moving particle along the circular path also in terms of x and y coordinates, okay? And we can then relate that to the radius, right? Which is just the hypotenuse of the triangle, okay? So that's, that's the idea. Now, think about this way. Imagine you're viewing this uniform circular motion, not from the top, right? We often imagine viewing uniform circular motion, kind of bird's eye view, looking down on it, clearly seeing the circular path, but from the side, completely from the side. So you actually can't see all of the motion. You, the, any motion that is towards or away from you is completely invisible to you. Maybe you have one eye closed or something, right? You cannot tell if the object is moving towards you or away from you. You can only see the side to side part. And now imagine that for a second, right? Now close both eyes and imagine it. Because if you imagine that type of motion viewed by this eye, then what, you'd, what you would see is you would see the mass, mass M, bouncing back and forth like a spring, wouldn't you, right? So you can, kinda, you can see then that that spring motion, that bounce back and forth, going fastest to the middle, slowing down at both extremes, right, going back and forth sinusoidally, that that really is just circular motion viewed from the side. Now let's show it mathematically. Okay, because it's one thing to you know, kind of maybe conceptually understand it, but let's show that it works. Okay, so we have at um, at a so we have a couple times. So the initial time is, is entirely moving away away from you. So v naught equals v y, uh, all right. And then at some later time, it's entirely moving to the side. So you'd be able to see the motion when it's entirely in the x direction, and when the velocity is entirely in the y direction, it'd be invisible to you. Okay. And then um, we have the, a triangle for the velocity and the triangle for position are called similar, which means they're just identical angles, all right? So they're both right triangles and whatever the angles of those right triangles are, they, they change in lockstep. They're, they're absolutely identical, identical triangles. See that, right? See how the, these, the two triangles have to be identical to one another, okay? And it turns out that the, that form of identical angles takes, takes a ratio of the x component of velocity over the y component of velocity equaling the y position over the x position. And, and that's because when the velocity is entirely in the x direction, the position is entirely y, right? Because look, look at the top, right? When the velocity is entirely moving to the side, where's the position? It's entirely vertical. On the other hand, if you look at the, when the velocity is entirely in the y direction, this one here, well then what is, what's the position? The position is entirely horizontal. Right, so that, that, that's kind of the extremes of when the triangles become lines, and, but still showing that they're, they're in lockstep with each other. They're similar triangles, okay? So then using that relationship, we can say then that when, v, when Vx is max, Y is max, and when Vy is max, X is max. That's a good way to put it, right? Okay, and so then we, then we can rewrite this, okay? So we can rewrite the Y component as just V, okay? And we can rewrite the X component as R, okay? And, there, and then we can solve for y, and this will be the square root of r squared minus x squared. I'm just, I'm just sol solving, solving for y, okay? And basically, um, not y from the similar triangle expression, but just y from the triangle of position, right? This is, just the, this is just the Pythagorean theorem. That's all this is, is just the Pythagorean theorem, okay? And so then, we then can combine those together. So now I'm just gonna replace y with the expression from the Pythagorean theorem and we've already replaced x with r, all right? And then I'm gonna go ahead and solve for vx. And look what I get. I get an expression for the velocity. Expression for the velocity as a function of position, okay? And let's rewrite it a little bit by factoring out the, um, basically a one over r, and look what we get, right? Or you're kind of really combining, right? you know, basically the, the expression inside the square root. What we get is the equation for simple harmonic motion where the x component of velocity is just velocity, because that's, again, the only part that's visible to us. The y, the y component of velocity is effectively invisible. It doesn't show up, right? And the v equals v max, because at some point where the velocity is entirely in the horizontal direction, like when v naught equals vx, well, then that's, that's when it's moving the fastest from our viewpoint, right? Where we can only see the side-to-side -side motion. We can't see the back and forth motion. And the reason that we know this is the right equation is, look, this is, this is one of the equations from our key equations, right? This, this is the relationship between velocity and position. Indeed, we've shown that uniform circular motion and simple harmonic motion are the same, okay? It's just a matter of perspective, okay? So let's, let's look at um, our final examples, okay?
So let's see, because we got an energy one, and then we've got um, two more, which are energy as a function of time. Okay, so let's get through, let's get through these last few examples. We've done we've done a lot, so I'm just going to kind of go through these last last few examples at a good clip. Okay, all right. So we've got a one kilogram particle is in simple harmonic motion along the x-axis. The amplitude of the motion is 0 0.764 meters at one point in its motion. Its kinetic energy is five joules, and its potential energy is 3.3 joules. Okay, and so from this information, we want to find out what's the amplitude, which is x equals x, xm, m standing for max, the kinetic and potential energies, and then writing the equation of motion for it. Okay, all right. So we're going to um, we're going to set the maximum amplitude as point, uh, 0.764 because we we're given that. Okay, but just clarifying that it is the amplitude. We'll go ahead and combine our energy terms to find out the total energy is 8.33 joules, just combining the kinetic and the potential. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and then acknowledge that full amplitude, there can't be kinetic energy because it's entirely um, potential at that point. That's the potential energy is the total energy, and that was the question in part A. Okay, in part B, we're going to do a bit more. So, um, what is, so here in part B, we're asked write an equation for the motion. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and find. Um, K, which we weren't given, so we'll go ahead and find K is 28.5 newtons per meter. I'm just solving for it from the expression, okay, from this expression here, all right. And then we're just going to piece that together to find omega because now that we have um, both um, K and M, we can easily find omega, okay, using the expression that the angular frequency omega is the square root of K over M, all right. So we're good there, 5.34 radians per second, and there we go. There we have our position function. X as a, as a function of time is point is the amplitude 0 0.764 meters times cosine of 5.34 radians per second times t. Right, it's a function of time. Okay, and then how much time passes between the potential energy being 3.3 joules and zero? Oh, that's interesting. How do we do that? Okay, well let's think about this. So basically, we set 3.3 joules. We set it equal to our position function. Okay, well, but specifically a position function that, function that's plugged into the energy. Right, because we know that the that as, as a function of time, we have that one, one half kx squared is, is our expression for the potential energy as a function of time, where x, x is a function of t. So then we can just plug in our cosine function into the x as a function of t and square it. Right? And that, that's what we've seen here. That's why we have cosine squared. And then we just have to isolate t. Okay, So we'll just find t. And that, that's just a, ma a matter of doing the algebra, right? So we got to go through. I did it all in one step here. But you're going to go ahead and isolate t, and we get 0.166 seconds. And then we can just plug that back in, all right? Well, in this case, actually, we'll find that T2, T2 occurs when potential energy is zero, which is one quarter of a period. And then one quarter of a period minus the time that we found will give us our actual delta T, okay? So we find that a quarter of a period is 0.294 seconds. So 0.294 minus 0.166 is how much extra time it will take to go from 3.33 joules of potential energy to zero joules of potential energy. And of course, when you have zero joules of potential energy, you've got all kinetic energy. Okay, all right. So now let's do another time, a more directly time-dependent energy of an oscillator system problem. So a vertical hooky and spring hangs from the ceiling. The spring is assumed to be massless and is at rest. Um, three two-kilogram masses are hung by um, string from the end of the spring, and the spring is carefully allowed to stretch 26.5 centimeters downward and come to rest. Then one of the masses is suddenly cut off. And that's in the start of the oscillation. What will be the resulting position function? of this spring with the two remaining attached masses, okay? So let's think about how, how what this one looks like, okay? There's, there's our, uh, our scissors that we're cut it with, okay? So this is, kind of, this is the picture of the system. So you can see there's three attached masses at first, which stretch, stretches the spring all the way down to what's called equilibrium for 3M. But once we cut it off, then there's just two left. So there's gonna be a new equilibrium point. And what's gonna happen is now the system with the two remaining masses will, will oscillate back and forth above and below that equilibrium point. It will never actually return to its original rest length because it's still because it's got a new equilibrium, right? Okay. All right. So let's think about how we'll, we'll set this up. So you will use the initial equilibrium state to find the spring constant. Okay. So this and this is this is why this is this particular type of problem because um, I, I guess I misspoke a minute ago and said it's an energy um, problem. This is actually a type of problem where there's some extra step. An extra step here is actually using Hooke's law to find the spring constant. Okay. So we'll use all three masses to find the spring constant. Okay, because we're given the extension when all three are attached. Okay, so 3 mg divided by y will give us a spring constant of 222 newtons over, over meters. Okay, and then the amplitude is this going to be the difference between that maximum stretch and whatever is going to be the um, basically you know the y prime, which is the which is the equilibrium for only 2 m. Well, equilibrium for 2 m would be 2 mg over k, the k that we just solved for. Right? See, we're, we're already using the k value we solved for. 
And so therefore our amplitude would be 0 0.0883, right? So 8.83 centimeters, okay? And then we can find the angular frequency. We could have, you know, and in this case, we want to find the angular frequency um, with just the two remaining masses because that it's, it's never going to oscillate if all three because it only starts oscillation once you cut off the third. So notice the M is four kilograms, not six, okay? And we get an angular frequency of 7.45. And then we just plug it in because now we have the, the pieces we need, omega and, and, um, and A, and we plug in the information and we've got ourselves a time-dependent position function. Notice here I'm using Y to imply that it's a vertical motion rather than a horizontal motion, okay? All right, last one. Okay, so in this case, we have a collision where momentum is gonna be conserved and then not energy because it's inelastic collision. And then we're gonna have energy conservation during the resulting compression after the collision. And then the oscillation begins, okay? All right, so we've got a mass, 7.12 kilograms, is traveling at 2.37 meters per second along a frictionless surface. It's then going to collide with M2 in a perfectly inelastic collision. M2 has a mass of 12 kilograms. It's at rest, okay? It's attached to a hooking spring with a spring constant of 114 newtons per meter. Okay, so first thing we want to do is use conservation momentum and energy to find the maximum compression, okay? Because the maximum compression, that's our amplitude. And once you have the amplitude, what's the only other thing we need? Omega. And then we, can, then we got ourselves a, a function, right? Okay? All right, so we'll use momentum. Initial momentum equals final momentum, so P equals P prime. Um, the initial momentum is just the momentum of, the, the, of M1, so it's M1 V0, and then it's gonna equal the final momentum of the system when they're stuck together. That, that allows us to solve for the final velocity, and the final velocity after the collision is 0.883 meters per second. Obviously much slower because a lot of energy was lost, you know, and, and it's just a bigger, bigger object with the two of them stuck together. Okay, and then we use conservation of energy to relate, to relate that, an, that initial kinetic energy immediately following the collision, the inelastic collision, to the maximum compression of the spring. And then once it's actually com maximally compressed, then we'll start the time. The time then that will be the resulting continual oscillation that will continue forever because there's no friction or anything in this idealized system. Okay, so we'll use energy conservation. Uh, notice we're using the total mass because they, they are now os they're going to you know compress together and then ultimately oscillate together. We'll use the spring constant and we'll solve for x. I call it x max or x, okay? And then we'll solve for that maximum compression and it gives us 0.361, so 36.1 centimeters, okay? And so that means we can definitely we're set up to solve for the angular frequency because we've got the spring constant now um, and we've got the total mass. In fact, um, we actually always could have solved for the angular frequency. All right, so then we'll go ahead and do that and we get 2.44 radians per second. So basically we have everything we need. We've got amplitude and angular frequency. So we plug it in and we got ourselves our position function. And then in part B, how much time will pass after t equals zero until the spring force has a magnitude of 25 newtons? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Let's wrap up with that. Okay, so we're gonna use Hooke's law to find x. So then a, so when, when are we gonna get 25 newtons? Well, that's gonna correspond, right? So it's just, just solving for x. So taking the force over k that corresponds to 21.9 centimeters. So right away we can tell that's a little less than fully compressed. So obviously there, there's even more, more force when, when it's fully compressed at its maximum compression of 36.1, right? Okay, and so then we can go, find, go ahead and find out how much time it takes to get there. Okay, so we'll, go, we'll set this up and solve for T, all right? And then just isolate T and solve for it. And we get 0.377 seconds, all right? That's how long, that's how long it takes to go from a point where it's maxly compressed, which would be a larger force than this, a larger force than 25, until the force is reduced a little bit. And notice here I say, you know, how much time will pass. Obviously, there, there'd be an infinite number of answers because this will return to a value of 25 newtons over and over again, okay? So I'm assuming it's the minimum time, the very first time that 25 newtons is achieved. And that's after, well, 0.3377 seconds. Okay, all right, well, there we have it, right? A good, thorough introduction to the spring oscillating system. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the pendulum oscillating system. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this lecture. I hope it has been very interesting and informative.